Welcome to Courageous Dialogues, a podcast where I try and get to the heart of the matter with people in your community. In this episode of Courageous Dialogues, I speak with Lisa Sisson. She is the founder of Unearth and has been listed as one of the top 20 Australian women making moves in 2022 in the Australian Business Journal. Thanks, Lisa, for coming on to Courageous Dialogues. Um, Could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and who you are? Wow, a little bit about myself. So I'm Lisa Sisson. I'm the founder of Unearth, uh, which is a specialised risk uh, consultancy organisation that focuses around a people-centred approach to risk versus the good old-fashioned tick boxes. Um, So I've actually, originally I'm from New Zealand, so don't hold that against me, but I've been here nearly 30 years. Uh, So I, I think that sways in the side of Australia. I've spent more of my life here in Australia now. So uh um, lucky to be here. Yeah. Okay. So this year you've been listed in the Australian Business Journal as one of the top 20 make, women making moves. Tell us a little bit about that. I, it appears I'm making some moves. <laughs> I mean, what does one say about uh, a head, like a title like that? Uh, I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that I've, um, you know, I've been, cons- I've I've got a nickname, uh, one I've actually even put in my LinkedIn, which is a, a risk rebel. So it's a fun one in relation to the fact that we're looking at risk in a very disruptive way. And disruptive, not meaning it's a bad word, but more around really making people rethink how they approach risk management uh, altogether. Because for so long, and I mean for so long, the traditional approaches has been to have these sort of tick boxes and to really separate people from risk management which is kind of crazy. It's kind of like this thing over there. And it's like this whole fear area where, you know, people, when they think about risk management or risk in general, it's one of those things. It's a little bit smoke and mirrors. The industry has made it a bit smoke and mirrors, made it very complicated. And it makes it one of those things that a lot of people tend to fear. And in some ways, rightfully so, because the consequences associated to risk management can be incredibly high. We only need to look at what happened with the Royal Commission around the whole finance sector um, and what the outcomes of some of those things were. But our attitude is that, you know, risk starts and ends with people. And we say equally, opportunity starts and ends with people. And it really comes back to if you aren't sort of looking at risk and and managing risk with and through your people, then really how effective are you at managing risk? Because your people touch every aspect of the business. And when you think about risk management, a lot of people think about it as there's a few people who come up with this great strategy and then there's this plan. But guess what happens? Your people are the ones who really have to execute that plan and every decisions and actions they make. So we're really trying to get people to rethink how they look at risk and risk management and understand that the only way to do it effectively is actually embracing their people, working with their people, doing it with and through their people. So that's kind of a little bit of a nutshell, the kind of stuff we're getting into. Now, I um, met you a few years ago and to be honest, I'm I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about the audience because I'm thinking, okay, what will the audience want to know? And I guess one of the things that they would want to know, uh, what kind of risk are we talking about when, when we're talking about people? What kind of risk? Well, uh, we talk about, um, because we have a, a people-centred approach to risk, we say there's only two ways to look at risk. That's risk to a person or risk by a person. And so it doesn't matter if that's through natural natural hazards, like, you know, disasters, fires, floods, anything to do with Mother Nature herself or anything like that, you know, being out in terrain, or whether it's in relation to um, human-created risk, which can be anything from theft, cybersecurity, anything in that relation. So and some people might say that seems pretty simplistic, but that's actually where the power is, because when you go into a business for example for so long we go in and we like I said we look at these tick boxes we get these tick boxes and we get so focused on these tick boxes and we do it because it becomes this defendable piece of paper right that we get to defend that oh, we've ticked these boxes 
So we've managed risk, but in fact, that's not the case of how we're managing risk. And one of the biggest risks that we're actually seeing, and, and I was actually in the, um, um, oh, in the, I was going to say, oh, the financial review recently where they did an article when we were talking about that risk, um, when you look at sort of disengagement, it's at a pandemic sort of level. Mm. And that's one of the biggest risks any organisation actually has today in their business. You know, Gallup says 80% of employees are not engaged or actively disengaged. That is four out of five people that are not engaged. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think, you know, disengagement, hmm, isn't that performance-based? Isn't that just when people aren't doing their jobs properly? I challenge that because it's actually more than that because when people are not engaged, they do bare minimum, right? They will do things to a bare minimum. They make more mistakes. They literally became, become unintentional insider threats. And so when you look at things like insider threats and we're seeing that, Two thirds of all insider threat incidences are unintentional. There's a real correlation between that. And then the other part, obviously, is then you sort of move into when people are sometimes disengaged, um, some are being motivated to become quite disgruntled. So that's where we start seeing active people who are inside a threat. So, you know, it's, it's a real challenge, it's a real situation, which is why we've sort of been talking about you've got to stop. Uh, looking at that white elephant in the room and start to realise that we need to start addressing your biggest risk. So um, I'm hearing human behaviour and a result of COVID, I would assume, from work at home in terms mm. of that risk that's coming out. So there's a lot of work there that's still being done because a lot of businesses would still be in a work from home situation here in Victoria. Yeah, yeah I think... Uh, yeah, well, I think um, prior to COVID, this was this was still very much the case. I think what COVID's really done is it's just really heightened everything. It's just really made thing everything more sensitive. And suddenly organisations, you know, large organisations, small organisations, had to stop and literally change the way they work. And so when you think about, you know, when you're in your work environment, there's all these controls within the business, you know, um, you're accessing printers, you might be scanning documents, they're usually in a, in a very secure environment within your business. And suddenly, um, and obviously accessing your your the data, being the fact that you're actually in an office, then suddenly all these people are needing to work from home, right? So starting to think about the fact of where the data is now flowing into home network systems, not access to um, the, the printers that they would normally have within the office, all these other things starting to come into play. So a lot of organisations did not, did not know how to really cope with that for one. And then comes the other part. How does one stay connected to their people? Mm -hmm. How does one encourage them to still meet all the KPIs that they still need to meet in a remote setting? There were a lot of challenges. I mean, I I don't know what it's been like for you and some of your listeners, but I can't tell you how many times I had conversations where I had examples of executives saying to me that for the first time, members of their team were pushing back really, really hard because they were doing it through a camera. They weren't meeting KPIs. They were talking back to the executives. They were saying it was all too hard. And let's be fair, on both sides of this, everybody was trying to adapt. Everybody was struggling. Um, there was fear on both sides from the business, fear of understanding what their people were doing and were the current control measures, and I use that word control measures, mm -hmm. suitable for that environment. On the flip side, can't tell you how many employees I've spoken to who felt that they had to be at their desk almost like 10 to 12 hours a day and, and, and felt an awkward to go and, you know, even leave their system for fear of thinking that um, the work might think they weren't working. I mean, talk about a mess. It's it's not ideal. So, um, so I think it was a real challenge to everybody. 
So last time, I'm not sure if you're aware, but last time I met you, I was actually working in government. So that's how I came across your work. Um, and you were starting up. I'm actually a teacher now in a school. So I stepped into the school just as COVID hit. So we had sort of security issues, you know, in terms of cameras on, students, you know, working from bedrooms. So it was sort of a different type of issues. But I remember you were starting up your business, would it? No, I've been in business. No. So we've been in business nine years now. Um, yeah. So ten years early next year. So we've been we've been focused with a lot of large enterprise. In fact, the last time we caught up, we were about to do some work with a very large corporate down in Victoria, which we did do, and finish that first stage just before COVID hit, and then it all went went yeah. very a lot more difficult after that. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about you ran a courageous leadership sort of event online what was that about so I think both in the government sector or um, the public sector and the private sector you know one of the things myself and and other people that I work with we have a, a partnership ecosystem that I work with some really amazing people from all around the world internationally and locally and one of the things that we we have been seeing um and hearing a lot is challenges within leadership. People, leaders not feeling that they have can have a voice or that they can take a direction and show true leadership. And so myself and um, a lovely, a truly lovely lady by the name of Carolyn Button Madden and I put together a courageous leadership uh, webinar that we did. And it really was to try and encourage, one to highlight, some, some leaders who were being courageous in their, in their leadership, but two, to kind of talk about what it needs to start looking like, you know, what people were calling for. I mean, we put out surveys to actually ask the audiences what they thought courageous leadership needed to be. And then we started to unpack it in a, in a, in a way around how do we start to bring leaders, and they don't have to be executives, by the way, you know, courageous leadership isn't just done by it through executives. You don't have to have a title, but just trying to encourage people young older wherever they are to really connect with themselves and to show up as the leaders that they want to be like so then we can decide whether or not those are the people we want to follow and I think if you looked probably to what we've been through in the government even just with the last election you know that was a real wake-up call to say you know we, we've had enough of this I mean look at the amount of independence they got on there's a lot of things that are changing because people are really getting to the point where they want to see people stepping forward, ethical, courageous leadership, transparent leadership is what is being needed. And so we highlighted a few people through that, through that actual webinar, but more than anything, it was a calling to want to encourage them. And I've had a couple of um, interviews with some other people afterwards who have also been what we would consider leaders who have been really courageous in their style. And is it what is one thing coming out, one or two things coming out, highlighting it in terms of the actions or the behaviors or, you know, the kinds of leaders that are coming out that would fit sort of a true leadership lens? I think that, yeah, I think the thing that really has been standing out for me um, through all the surveys and stuff is people want, they want transparency. But they want it to be genuine. They don't want people to to tell them what you know what they think you want to that they want to hear. They want the right people to show up as who they are, and and speak with with a voice that is really something that connects them to their passion, their purpose, and what they're about. And I think it's been lacking in so many areas. I think the connection to people uh, within government has been really challenging. I mean, we've got a few politicians that I. You know, you've started to see stand out in different areas, but there has just been almost like this separation that's happening when, especially through COVID, you know, we need connection. As human beings, we need connection and we need to be inspired and we need hope because one of the things we've seen all around the world um, through COVID was the challenges for us to see a future. What a future looked like beyond COVID. What a future looked like and our new working conditions, because we can't go back. There is no going back. There is only going forward. And I would often say, why would you want to go back? Because there were a lot of unhappy people 
who were in an environment and COVID woke a lot of people up. You know, you've heard about the great resignation and, mm. you know, those were symptoms and um, that have been there for a long time. And I think all COVID really did was just for people to turn around and say, you know what, life is a little too short. I want to kind of reevaluate and I want to be felt like I, I add value to where I work. I'm going to spend all this time working for a company. I want to feel like I'm valued. And it's not always about money. I mean, so many people were willing to move roles and take pay cuts as long as they felt they were contributing and there were conditions in which they felt uh, were respectable and they were safer than what they were in their, car- their other conditions. So there's a lot in it. I have these kind of conversations with some amazing people, especially in recruitment around this stuff, because um, there's a lot of churn going over and we're going to have a lot of shortfalls in certain industries. But, um, you know, what I think is most important and what I've seen personally is that people really want to connect with people going on a journey that they can be a part of. I think that's what deep mm. down. So I'm hearing that people want, you know, authentic leadership and people are moving to sort of, I guess, look for work that's more community sort of service, more fulfilling roles that suits them deep down rather than selecting a career? Um, I think you can still have a career, but it just depends oh. on, if they, yeah, so. Yeah, that, that job. I should have said a job, not a career. Yeah. So rather than <laughs> just, yeah, okay. Um, I, just, I think it's got to be that connection for them, right? I think it's really important that, um, I, I mean, like you, you've, you've made a move. You just said you've moved out of government into education. Yeah, this is so, just, just before COVID hit, though. <laughs> doesn't matter, but there still was a reason why you yeah. moved. So why did you move? Uh, for exactly that, more sort of community, sort of giving back to the community. And I love teaching when I was doing it ages ago and I got to the point where I thought, you know what, I just want to go back and do what I love. So um, here I am. <laughs> um, actually, podcasting started as a, sort of last year with my year nines and ten students to engage them into the classroom I was inviting people to talk about different you know their careers and different pathways and you know the kids were coming on to listen to it and it was very interesting and for me I I sort of love doing it and I thought I've carried that that on this year and um, just to show the connections between education but also everything else and, and like you said the human behavior um it, we're all connected and i love the title your book um that you wrote risk starts and end with people and i do remember uh, a conversation that we had years ago you're fascinating to me thank you <laughs> um i had one somewhere and, i knew there was somewhere <laughs> and um you were talking to me about um how you know, through the lens that you look through in terms of the human behaviour, how, you know, looking into it like a bank, I guess, um, or, you know, an organisation, you're looking at the human elements. And, and then you spoke a little bit about, and I'm not going to repeat anything you said, but you talked about the impact that it had with yourself and the relationships that you had. So do you, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because I don't want to retell that story incorrectly. <laughs> No, uh, well, actually, um, since we even caught up, when I wrote the book even, I have to say that the process of of sharing um, what's become our, our system for risk. So we've got a couple of things. We've got our system for risk, which is the really the core about what we're talking about, um, and that's around looking at a person, what makes them tick. It's And we refer to it sometimes as their risk cocktail and all these sorts of things, but it's really understanding a person, their predisposition, uh, which is all your values, your beliefs, your whole life journey, you know, um, and then going into the area of then looking at uh, stresses, because, you know, as a, our predisposition, we're all so different. Even if we were twins, our, our life's journey is slightly different. So no two people are the same, but also then looking at stresses and how that affects people differently. Our little stress bucket that we have, you know, um, I think it's Beyond Blue has refers to the stress bucket as well, which I really, really love. But they're different sizes. We all hold different capacities. And depending on how full they get, they'll affect us differently. And then we talk about areas of understanding people's triggers because they're as unique as the individual themselves. And then we start to look at things like onset when people's behavior starts to change. So if something has triggered them, it can cause a change in behavior depending on what it is. And that's one of the things we look at, especially because... You know, I've done a fair bit of work around inside a threat. And so really understanding 
how often people come in to an organization, you know, enthusiastic to want to, you know, you start a new job, mm. want to be a part of something. So how do people start off being that enthusiastic than going on a journey to the point where they're willing to do harm to the organization and almost quite often self-harm as well as a result of it. So what in that, in that sort of transition, that journey, how did they get there? And so it's always been quite of an interest to me, but the other side of it is that, you know, when you go through this sort of process and I was really lucky, lucky one of the people on my team is a psychologist. And so when we were unpacking a lot of this stuff and she's also got a background around inside a threat, it actually can be quite confronting when you start to really peel back layers, but it's also very useful. So the, the, the whole framework we had as we went through and we described, you know, um, just a, a range of aspects around your predisposition or the rest of it. What we found interesting is it did not matter what situation I would go into personally or professionally, you'd start using this model. Like you'd start going through, and it's not to overanalyze someone, but if anything, it's to help to understand what you're seeing. Um, and there's been many examples where I've gone in and witnessed certain kinds of behavior, uh, especially when, because, you know, I work in a, in a space that's not a comfortable space to talk about, mm. you know, and so we try and make sure we create a safe, what we call a safe zone, a safe environment, so we can put things on the table without people feeling like they're being judged. It's better to go on the table so we can understand, see it, and then we've got things we can work with. Um, but that can also be around people's behavioral style. And I'll give you a, a more recent example of, of, I went into a situation recently where we were, talking to someone around the public safety work that we're doing. It's around stuff we're doing in um, what we call um, putting recovery first, planning under blue skies. So it's very much in that public safety sector. And because it's been a, a new area for us that we've been focusing on, um, we've been out having a bit of a chat about it. But we came across myself and, and um, Ian, who I, I work with, we went into a particular meeting where we were sharing the insights around our work. And what surprised me that was that the person on the other side clearly um, started to get quite agitated, like very agitated, mm -hmm. spoke very, very quickly. And, and, and it was interesting because I automatically knew there was a fear being triggered there. Something was happening to make this person. And it wasn't until, and I didn't know why, because, you know, this person was a known person um, to my colleague. And, um, but once we started, I started listening. I think I said about 10 words in the whole conversation. I just kind of let this thing play out. Um, but once I started to see what was going on, it was really interesting how I was literally just unpacking the model. I could see there had been what the fear um, that was flushing out and I could pick up on the words and started to categorize some things. And it was really useful for me because instead of going in there and feeling like it potentially um, could always be like an attack, because for some people they might've felt that way, I was just curious and you know what about with learning the best thing you can ever be is just curious and then what it does is when you're curious you can start to then try and get away from the fear to understand where that trigger or that issue actually was and all it was was that they in their mind had interpret we we, we focus in very much the recovery space mm -hmm. they had a fear that we were going to be playing in a different space and they felt threatened by that um, just because of the color of the people that we work with, they actually felt threatened by that. And we were like, no, no, this is where we play. This is where we're happy to play. This is where our focus is. This is what we do. But it was more than anything. I like to work with people. I think you know that about me. Mm -hmm. And so when I see people in a situation where fear comes out, it's really useful that you don't then add fuel to the fire. You can you can actually start to peel back the layers in a nice way in a transparent way where you can put things on the table. And if anything else, what I often say is defuse the situation then encourage it to escalate because often when if you get one person who's kind of feeling a little bit threatened, then usually the other person armors up, right? They start to armor up and suddenly this debate happens. Whereas, you know, our whole point around what we're doing is that the best thing you can do when you see something escalate is realize that someone's in pain. Why have they come to you? And, and suddenly spoken to you in a way. Um, and sometimes it's really hard to catch yourself because sometimes it feels like an attack. So how do you do that? So that's been one of the benefits out of it. But, you know, it's you've got to challenge yourself too because you've also got to be self-aware as well as situationally aware. And sometimes you have to be aware when you get triggered 
mm. something happens to you, like uh, the fires happened to me a couple of years back. We had the big fires. I was being very triggered by some of the events that were happening and, you know, catching myself to be very aware that that was happening was um, quite tough. So mm. there's two ways of doing it. All right. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. I want to ask so many more questions. But the, <laughs> uh, the one question I do want to ask you is, because this is Courageous Dialogues, mm. what's um, a time that you've been really courageous? Wow. I feel like I kind of edge into that a, a lot regularly. I think one of the things that I said to my team, because um, I've always been someone who tends to just get on with the job. I've never been one about self-promotion and those sorts of things. That's always been very difficult for me. So when I actually wrote the book, because that was a lot of hours I was getting up. By the way, I didn't plan to write a book. I started, <laughs> just just to say, you know, what, what I started to do was to share the, the system for, for our system for risk. I wanted to get it down on paper and it also talk about our protect framework. And so I was unpacking my brain, but my brain was firing usually about one o'clock in the morning. So about one o'clock, most mornings I was up just writing, writing, writing. And then suddenly um, after I got to about 40 something thousand words, I went, oops, I think I'm writing a book. And that's what the title was. Mm -hmm. of it for 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 a long time right to be honest with you so once I unpacked my brain it was the book was actually double the size where I originally had it so then I had to go through a post process of of peeling it back so I think one of the hardest things that I did was one to put it in front of a, an initial audience who had the beta, the beta version of my book which were people from around the world who were extremely um known experts in their fields to first read my book and put it out there and see what they thought and then came the, I think something that I think is quite courageous for anybody is to put yourself out there write it and then stand behind it and talk about it because it's it's not as easy as what people think people think a lot of people think people write books for some sort of vanity thing mm -hmm. I never did that this was for me I wanted to share something that could help people I wanted to simplify risk, demystify risk. I wanted to make it something that could really make a difference in someone's life. And it goes against the grain of just about all the traditional models. So I I thought that was pretty courageous. And now I'm doing a university course off the book. So <laughs> the university reached out to me and did that. So that's been very courageous because it, that's teaching is your you know, expertise, it's, it's not mine. So I'm just trying to make it something where people get curious and, and can be engaged with it. So that's been another area I'm stepping into. It's not comfortable. Thank you, Lisa, for coming on to Courageous Dialogues. Um, <laughs> talking about writing, I, I did, <laughs> I'm trying to do some blogging again, but you're right, it's so hard. <laughs> I read what I've written and I'm just like, that just does not make sense. I'm not posting that up just yet. So maybe I'll get back to all of these little bits and pieces that I've been putting together. Be adventurous, be courageous, be brave. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find that people will enjoy reading it and, and want to hear it. So just, just give it a go.